Welcome to another episode of Kelly's Reality. Today, our distinguished guest is Christina Kuzmich. She is an author and vlogger, and even if her name doesn't sound familiar to you, I can guarantee you've seen some of her viral truth bomb videos floating around YouTube or Facebook. So Christina, thank you so much for joining me today. I'm really happy to have you here. And how are you today? I'm doing great. Exhausted as always, which is normal. I, I hear you. My yeah. youngest has not slept through the night and he's five oh. now. So I haven't slept in about five years, but somehow you just find a way to push through and like autopilot. I know. Isn't it amazing what we're actually capable of? It really is. Wow. Yeah. Oh gosh. Yeah. Parents, especially moms, I think have superhuman qualities. It's, mm -hmm. it's the only way I can, can explain things. Yeah. <laughs> now as a therapist, I especially I'm passionate, I've dedicated my career to really breaking not only mental health stigmas, but this whole mentality that a lot of people have that you have to do this all by yourself and not only do it by yourself, but you have to make it look effortless and perfect while doing it. And that's why I've loved your videos, especially uh, just normalizing the you have to laugh at yourself side of parenting. Uh, it's so important. I love to bring humor into my therapy sessions and even on some of the tough moments, you know, even some of the grief sessions. Uh, it's important that, you know, the saying, if you don't laugh, you're going to cry is true. Right. And I think it's such a good, you know, mood lifter. You feel so much lighter after having a good laugh. And, and so I loved, I've been a fan of your videos for years and um, I love what you're doing with that. Thank you. I actually write in my um, book how for me, Going through life without humor is like eating soup with a fork. Ah, like you're yes. still going to get a little bit of stuff out of okay. there, but you're going to miss out on so much goodness if you can't learn to laugh at yeah. even the crazy stuff. Yeah. I mean, you 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 really, really have to. Um, it's almost like if you have a pot boiling on the stove and you have a lid on it, uh, mm -hmm. you can't really see what's going on under the surface until it blows up. Yeah. And our goal is to not get people to blow up and, and diffusing it with humor is an excellent way to do that. Uh, and I love to, again, breaking stigmas about stuff. You've spoke really openly about how you kind of hit your rock bottom, especially with your own mental health. And what I love is I had heard an interview with you that you had spoke about uh, giving to others and kind of getting out of yourself and putting that energy into other people was a way out of that for you. And um, can you talk a little bit about that and pulling yourself up from, from that rock bottom? Yeah. So I ended up um, basically newly divorced with two little kids. My kids were a year and a half and three when I left mm -hmm. and I sunk into a deep depression. Mm -hmm. And then on top of that, you know, had to apply for food stamps and I couldn't even afford an apartment just for us. I, Mm -hmm. rented a small room and the kids and I all slept in the room. I slept on the floor, couldn't even afford a bed, had a roommate in the other room and just kind of felt worthless and horrible and hated myself and ended up actually writing a list of pros and cons of how my suicide would affect my children. Mm -hmm. And the pros list, meaning my kids will be better off without me, was longer than the cons mm -hmm. list. So I really hit rock bottom. And then what I realized is that I became obsessed with myself, which I think happens a lot when you're, you know, in such a low place where you're mm -hmm. obsessed with how much your life sucks and everything sucks and it'll never get better. And I'm a horrible human being. And, you know, all these lies that we start believing. Mm -hmm. And I thought I just had an epiphany one night and I thought the only way to get out of this me, 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 mm -hmm. is to think outside myself. And so I tried to volunteer. I thought maybe that'll help. I got rejected from every place because oh I had to bring my kids, I couldn't afford a babysitter and, you know, yeah. hospitals and soup, you know, kitchens, yeah. two and a three-year-old. And so finally I thought, okay, if nobody will have me, is there something I have to offer? Like even when mm -hmm. I'm at my worst, uh -huh. when I hate myself, when I feel like my life has no meaning, is there one little thing I'm confident in? And the only thing I could think of is I know how to make a great meal on a tiny budget. Yep. And kind of impulsively ended up inviting a bunch of people over, told my friends, if you know anyone, you know, a college kid who's sick cafeteria food, a person who's struggling financially, maybe an elderly person who just lost their spouse and they're sad, whatever the need is, I don't care. Mm -hmm. Bring them over, I will feed them every Wednesday night. Yeah. That first Wednesday night, um, I fed over 30 people. I still get to have even love told the story. Oh my gosh. I fed over 30 people on food that I bought at the 99 cent store because it's all I could afford. And 
it changed my life. And what I realized, it, that was my turning point. You know, I don't, I, I'm always very careful to tell people nothing happens overnight. Right. So it's not like the next day I was happy and everything, you know, depression was gone. But it was a turning point for me because the lesson I learned and I still use today in my life instead of dwelling on the long list of things I can't do and yeah. I don't have and I'm not capable of, what if I focus on that one thing that might seem tiny and insignificant in the moment? But if I focus on that one thing I can do and mm -hmm. have, that is where the turning point happens. Yeah. And, and again, I still use that today, even though life's in a better yeah. place. When I feel overwhelmed, I'm like, what is that one little thing I can do? Let's yeah. do that. Yeah, and that's so important. I, you know, I have even this week I talked to clients about that gratitude attitude. It comes up in almost daily, and it's something that I practice myself. And look, you don't. There's no shortage of negativity in the world. All you have to do is scroll your social media feed, turn on the news. Uh, but like you said, if you can find even one thing, and sometimes people have a hard time finding things to be grateful for. So maybe. Maybe it's the fact that, you know, your heart is beating, um, your legs are working, you're healthy, you know, going back to basics, but focusing on what we can control and what is going well is such a powerful tool. Yeah, I actually told the story uh, in my book how uh, there's a chapter called Recovering Pessimist because mm -hmm. I feel like I'm still in recovery. I will be forever. I'm naturally a pessimist. Yeah. And, and I was, I write in it how I tried the gratitude journal and for me, it just wasn't working. Mm -hmm. And and I was probably fighting it too hard and just being focusing on the negative. And so I said, okay, I'm going to do something for a whole year. Every day at the end of the day, before the last thing I'm going to do before I close my eyes is I'm going to write something good that happened that day. So it can't be just something general and grateful for, yeah. like, you know, my kids are alive and healthy. It has to be something specific that happened that day. Mm -hmm. And I started this. And by February, I was up for my dream job. I mean, literally the contract was in my hands. And it ended up falling through. And I had to find something good to write that day. May of that year, and I kept this up. May of that year, I miscarried twins. This is when I got remarried already. Mm -hmm. And I was just dead. I mean, went into a regular doctor's appointment that morning, didn't expect this. And I'm having to go through this procedure to have the babies removed. And I'm having to tell my older kids about this. And everybody's devastated. I'm laying in bed and I'm like, screw that stupid game. Nothing good happened today. Yeah. Today sucked. Mm -hmm. And as I was about to, about to basically quit and go, I'm not doing it today. Mm -hmm. I thought, no, I promised myself I would do this every single day. And the only thing I think of for that day is there was something about the way my husband tucked me into bed when he brought me back from the hospital. Mm -hmm. It just made me feel loved. And it was that mm -hmm. simple. I just wrote, I am loved. And my husband made me feel loved with the way he tucked me in. That is a moment mm -hmm. that under any normal circumstance, I would have overlooked and yeah. I would have fallen asleep mm -hmm. focusing on the loss and the grief and that's it. And instead I fell asleep feeling loved. And I did this for a whole year and I encourage anybody who struggles with negativity, try it, not just something general, it has to be mm -hmm. something specific. Yeah. So every day is good, but there is good in every day. You just yeah. have to look for it. Yeah, I love that. And that can apply to, especially right now, the climate mm -hmm. of the world, mm -hmm. everyone's so isolated, such strong emotions. And I love your advice to that. And, and it's something relatively simple. It doesn't cost money. You don't need materials to do it. You don't need another. I did it in, my, in the notes section of my phone because there I don't always have my phone near me. Uh -huh. And I love that I have this list now, 365 good things yeah. happen in this crazy year. That year was not easy, but yeah. there was good. And I love it too, because if you're having a particularly down day, you can just go back on your list and you know it's easy to get focused on what's going bad, that negativity spiral, but you open your list and you have 365 things that you know will make you happy and smile just looking at them again and remembering that, okay, life, life does have some really good moments too. Yeah, and my, my older two kids, uh, they're teenagers now. And so, you know, I think being a teenager is hard no matter what. Yeah. I think right now, during this time, it's even harder because they're not able to have their social life. It's so important for teens. Mm -hmm. We're still, I'm in California and we're still uh, on lockdown. Yep. And the one thing I keep telling them that really helped me when I was, you know, struggling is do not allow the few things that are completely out of your control to control you completely. Yep. And I think as humans, we really struggle with that. You know, yep. the minute a few things are out of our control, it's like we, we just kind of give up. And then instead of going, there, there are things that are, are in my control still. Yeah. What good can I do with that? Yeah. And now it's interesting. Have you ever thought of being a therapist? I think you have some great, <laughs> you have 
some great words of wisdom. But like you said, it was a journey for you too. It's not like you have always been a confident glasses half full person. It took a lot of negative moments and really kind of crawling out of those holes. Um, so I wonder if you're having a particularly tough day. I know your gratitude exercises, but how do you get yourself in a good headspace if you're really angry about something or sad about something? What's your go-tos? I mean, one of the things that has really helped me, again, beside the whole focus on what you can do, right? Mm -hmm. it's a lot of those, but things you can't do is, and I tell this to parents who follow my page all the time, you gotta give yourself more credit than criticism and more grace than judgment. And that is my mantra. Yeah. And so if I'm, you know, going through a tough day, you know, a lot of times the tough days are extra tough if we're tough on ourselves, yeah. right? So yeah. learn on those tough days to give yourself grace, to not lay in bed at the end of a hard day and go, oh my gosh, I got nothing done, or I did all this wrong, or this was awkward. How about lay in bed and start listing all the things that went right? Mm -hmm. Start listing all the things that you did accomplish. You know, especially as parents, we have these ridiculous to-do lists. They're, mm -hmm. they're basically emotionally abusive because yeah. they're realistic, right? And so at the end of the day, instead of going, oh, I'm going to Think about all the things in my to-do list that didn't get done. I think, no, I'm going to go over my ta-da list. Ta-da! I wrote that yet today. I didn't put on a bra, but who cares? My kids are bad. They were loved. I get a sticker and a trophy. I'm amazing. Yeah. Yeah. And I think just that mentality of, you know, where we expect ourselves to constantly be superhuman. Mm -hmm. and it's just like, stop chasing the fantasy and yeah. embrace the crazy, unpredictable adventure. Absolutely. And I love your, you know, don't sit there and, and think of where you fell short, like what didn't get accomplished. I love your ta-da list. Yeah. Like, what did I do? Um, because yeah. again, it's it's so important to focus on what you did get done, what you could control. Um, and also too, for me as a mom of two little ones, I'm really working hard on being a good enough mom and being okay with it. Like you said, our bar is set so high to be like these perfect parents and, and look perfect. And I'm like, okay, I can be good enough and be okay with that. Um, yeah. Long time work in progress as well, but I think that's something that, you know, we don't have to be perfect. We can be good enough. Yeah, there's a, um, actually it was one of the first videos of mine that went viral. It was the first, I think it was the first serious video I made because I started with just making funny videos. And, um, and I told the story how when I was still divorced and, you know, before I got remarried and I was struggling and I um, ended up, in, the, in therapy and the therapist completely changed my life. Mm -hmm. he, basically, I was sitting there going, you know, I'm a horrible mom and I used to be a good mom, but then after divorce and depression and poverty and all this, like I just suck. And he was, he said, well, give me some examples. I want specific examples. Mm -hmm. I said, okay. So before, you know, the divorce and all that, I used to cook my kids these elaborate meals because I love cooking and they were, you know, they really had great nutritious from scratch meals and now most days, it's literally just mac and cheese, like no side dish, no vegetable, and just mac and cheese out of a box. I said, I used to, you know, take my kids places. We used to go to museums and parks and all this. And now I'm so depressed. I literally just stick them in front of a TV and I cried and cry. Mm -hmm. And I kept going with these examples. And when I was done, sure that this therapist was going to go, whoa, you really <laughs> deteriorated. Yeah. He looked at me, it just so intense that I will never forget. And just said, Christina, you're incredible. You're amazing. And I'm like, is he mocking me? Uh -huh. And he said, think about it. You are so depressed. You feel so alone. Mm -hmm. and you take the time to go to the store and to buy that box of macaroni and cheese. And then you cook it. And I bet you even taste it before you serve it to them to make sure it's not too hot. Mm -hmm. How, how wonderful of you. And then you don't want them to see you crying all the time. So instead you put on their favorite cartoon so they can laugh and enjoy themselves while you go and hide your pain. How selfless of you. I mean, literally took every bad example I gave them and yeah. turned it into, you know, you're, you're wonderful and you're amazing and what a wonderful mom you are. And my gosh, like we have to learn to do that for ourselves. Yeah. You know, instead of going, I didn't do this. I didn't spend enough time. I didn't. Turn it around and go, I had a really bad day, but my children still felt loved. Yes. My children were still taken care of. Mm -hmm. Their basic needs are met. I mean, if, yeah. if, can you imagine if every parent just did that every day for themselves? Again, more credit than criticism, more grace than judgment. Yeah. God, I mean, it would be life changing. And again, these are all things that you can just do in your own head. It doesn't cost money to do them. And and really, it's just about shifting your, your perspective and, yeah. and giving yourself more credit. Um, 
one of my favorite videos that you had done was about how to create this fake perfect life on social media. And that's a topic that, again, I'm really passionate about. And uh, I work with a lot of young women uh, in my practice. So social media is huge. And the com again, the comparison thing, um, I didn't realize until I had started doing research how many apps there were to slim you, to change every feature on you. Um, and I don't think a lot of people even know that, that that's existing or that it took literally a hundred or so pictures to get one shot. And and I don't care your age or if it's your, your younger or older, seeing something like that that's airbrushed to perfection is hard not to compare yourself and then start feeling bad. Wow. Um, so I'm wondering how do you, um, well, first of all, do you limit your time on social media? Uh, do you read the comments on your own videos or posts? So for me, social media, I started just like everybody else. I got on social media. I have, I'm from Croatia. So the reason I originally joined Facebook was to see pictures of my new nephew. My sister had a baby. Mm -hmm. Never thought I would do any sort of work. Yeah. For my career would turn into this. Uh -huh. But, um, but now I really am on it mostly just for work and I don't really spend a lot of time, um, mm -hmm. you know, just browsing other people's stuff. Mm -hmm. I think, people have to be really honest with themselves because social media is only as good or bad as the person using it where, you know, where their headspace is at. Right. And so, um, the comparing and the competing, I mean, I think that is one of the number one things that is, you know, increasing people's depression and their insecurities issues and all of it. And so I've always tried to encourage people post the real stuff, post the money. I think we, I don't know where along the way we were brainwashed to believe that what makes us lovable is being perfect. Mm -hmm. The truth is when you, you probably don't even remember the perfect people you met. What you remember is the people who were vulnerable and yeah. opened up because they made you feel less alone. Yeah. They made you, you know, mm -hmm. it's that kind of stuff that really makes us lovable is mm -hmm. our vulnerability and authenticity. Being perfect is not going to make you lovable. Yeah. And yeah. bottom line, we all just want to be loved. Like that's yeah. what we need, right? We want to be mm -hmm. accepted. And then as far as the comments, um, definitely when I first started making videos and of course, anytime you put yourself out, you're going to yeah. get negativity. I would take those things personally. I would dwell on them. I would wonder if I should quit or I should change myself, you know, all that. Mm -hmm. And now over time, I'm really so past it. Mm -hmm. and the way I think of it, and again, I write about that in my book too, is yeah. I sort of think of it as when somebody is throwing judgment or hate at me, mm -hmm. what they're doing is they're trying to hand me their suitcase. Because we're all carrying around suitcases. We all have our stuff from childhood, our, our worry and our guilt and stuff from now and marriage and career. We all have our stuff. Mm -hmm. And when somebody is judging you and, and being hateful or whatever, they're basically saying, here's my suitcase and my stuff that I'm unhappy about. Yeah. My life didn't turn out the way I wanted it to. Things aren't going well. I'm not happy with myself. Mm -hmm. Carry it for me. Because yeah. they think that pain is like dodgeball. They're going to take that ball of pain. They're going to throw it at you and it's out of their hands. But it's not because, like I tell my kids, being a crappy human will never make you a happy. Human. Yeah, that's so. So, um, so I literally started picturing. You know, I used to be the person who would pick up everybody's suitcases. You hand me that hateful comment, I'm going to carry it. I'm going to look through it. I'm going to believe it. You know, I was like a bellhop, just carrying around everybody's suitcase. Uh -huh. And and then I started really practicing when I read a hateful comment or even mm -hmm. heard something in person. It can yeah. be yeah. You know, some people are getting hate from their parents in law, whoever. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Um. I, I used to really go, okay, before I pick up that suitcase, does that suitcase really have anything to do with me? Or is it about them? And mm -hmm. if you're able to be honest, then just don't pick up that suitcase. Yeah. And the truth is, there are people who are literally carrying our suitcases that were handed to them as a child, yeah. a parent, yeah. a suitcase that doesn't even belong to them. Mm -hmm. you know, basically a suitcase of lies about what they're worth and what they're capable of. Mm -hmm. And so now, because I think everything just takes practice. Now I don't even have to think about it. I'm just like not picking up your luggage, not picking up your luggage. Yeah, yeah. So able to read the comments and go, that person is in pain. Bottom mm -hmm. line, that person yeah. is in pain. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's such a great way to look at it too, because like you said, whether it's online, if you're a public figure, or maybe it's some kind of comment your mother-in-law makes, or, you know, a sister or something. I feel like no matter who we are, we're always dealing with negativity and criticism. Uh, another thing that comes up all the time is that unsolicited parenting advice. Mm -hmm. And it's like, it's one thing if, if I ask you for it um, or if I really value your opinion, but gosh, there's nothing like uh, everyone telling you their opinions from the second you get pregnant until, you know, I don't think it ever ends. Um, how do you deal with unsolicited parenting advice? 
So if it's coming from somebody, complete stranger, I don't even know. Mm -hmm. I mean, but I think I think the biggest problem with unsolicited advice is that we start to question ourselves, right? Mm -hmm. Immediately we're like, we're, we're feeling insecure. And again, remember that is their suitcase, okay? Mm -hmm. They're either unhappy with the choices they've made and now they're having to tell you to do it exactly the way you did it because the, the way they do it, because then it justifies the way they do it right. and they need to feel right, right? It's like, it's all comes from insecurity. Uh -huh. Or they are really that arrogant that they think that their yeah. one way is gonna work for everybody. Which yeah. by the way, I have three children. Mm -hmm. I have never, I can't think of one piece of parenting advice, like practical advice that has worked for all three of them the same. No. Because one kid might be a bicycle and you're like, I've mastered that. I'm going to I'm gonna be great at the second one. Well, the second one could be a tractor. Yep. And the third one is a spaceship and I've never operated that. So one, more, one kind of parenting advice is going to work for everyone. Uh -huh. anyway. Now, if it's someone close to me, like people always ask me, what if it's somebody I have to see all the time? It's right. my mother, it's my sister. Mm -hmm. You know, Arguing back and forth is not going to help, right? Mm -hmm. So what I always say is just say to them, you know what? I'm going to give that some thought. Yes. And then you don't have to give it any thought. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That ends it. I'm going to give that some thought. And yeah. then go about doing it your own way. Uh-huh. No, has there been any parenting advice throughout your years that you've been given that you've really appreciated or held on to? I mean, the the honestly, it's always, it's not like specific stuff. It's always the general of, this too shall pass. Yeah. It's a phase. Yep. Yep. It's not personal. Like all those things are really important to remember with teenagers. It's not yes. Personal. Yeah. Um, but it's really the best advice I've gotten is to stop chasing perfection and to uh -huh. stop comparing and competing and yes. to, to do it my way. You know, parenting, it's not a science, it's an art. And you yep. got to figure out what works for your family and for your specific kid. Because again, what works with one kid might not work with the next. Exactly. And also, to just, I, I, parents are, I, I swear it's scientific. The baby comes out and the guilt goes in. Oh yeah. And just learning to, that's another chapter in my book is called the G spot, but it's still with guilt, which yeah. is <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's exciting. But, um, but just learning to deal with that guilt and realizing like, it's so unnecessary. We pile on this guilt and we do it because we have set up a fantasy of what motherhood would look like, yep. what raising children would be like, of what our children, what, how we would deal with things. Mm -hmm. And then when none of it turns out that way because it's a fantasy, yep. you know, then we start feeling like there's something wrong with me. No, yep. there's something wrong with you. Life is unpredictable and life is hard. And yep. if you don't think parenting is hard, then you're probably doing something wrong. It's supposed to be For hard. Sure. Oh yeah, yes. And that kind of leads me into, I wanted to talk a little bit about your book, Hold On, But Don't Hold Still. And a big piece of that is like your discovery of you have to ditch the fairy tale. You have to ditch the fantasy and almost get this radical acceptance. Um, so can you tell me a little bit, why was it so important for you to write a book about these topics? So as my videos started going viral, I was getting more and more emails or messages, you know, and people were like, I need to know more. I need to know you know, how did you get through your depression? How did you get through your divorce? How come your ex-husband now sleeps over? You know, Christmas Eve, what is, what is wrong with you? How did you make that work? You used to hate him, you know, like so many questions. And I never thought about writing a book. And then when I got offered a book deal, I thought, oh my gosh, this is my way to answer. I, I couldn't answer every email. I couldn't yep, yep. answer every message because it got out of hand. Yeah. And I always felt a little bad about that because I thought, what if I'm the only person there reaching out to you? Uh, yeah. And so, I thought if I write a book, I want it to feel like my reply all. Mm -hmm. And I really think of it that way. I started, as I was writing, I thought about all the questions I got asked in emails, all the stuff people were struggling with. And I thought, is there something from my life and my story that could help them? And also, mm -hmm. what is the book I would have needed to read when I was at my rock bottom? Yeah. And so that's kind of how the book came about and why it was important for me to be really honest and vulnerable and you know, share the tough stuff in there. Yeah, yeah and I love that. And um, like I said, that way you can reach so many more people and it's just such, and, and I think, again, the, you're the real raw side of it too. It's not like, this is the only parenting book you'll ever need. And this is the advice. It's not like that. It's more just like, Hey, you know, come laugh with me, come learn from my mistakes, uh, share in the joys that I've had. And that's what I love about it because it's just so relatable and, and down to earth. Well, I kept telling my, uh, my editor, I, you know, as I was writing, I said, I don't ever want to come off as an expert. I'm not a therapist. Uh -huh. you know, I'm not a parenting expert. I, I don't ever want to come off as I am on this pedestal preaching yeah. down at you little people who need to follow my advice. Uh -huh. I'm 
more be like that friend who's like, listen, I've been through some crap too. Let me hold your hand through it and let's get through this together. Yeah, totally. Oh, I love it. I think everyone needs to go check out that book. If nothing else, you'll get some good laughs out of it. Some good, uh, some good stories from you. Thank you. Uh, now, for me, especially, I have a two-year-old and a five-year-old, and for many parents, it's really easy to get kind of frustrated and annoyed with the little things that are really development, developmentally appropriate, whether it's your two-year-old tantruming, your teenager slamming the door on you. Um, we all have been there. No matter how zen of a parent you are, there's stuff that just triggers you from our kids. Wow. And I'm wondering... Um, how do you bring a sense of humor and lightheartedness even into those really hard moments? I mean, sometimes you just need a break. You know, mm -hmm. sometimes you just need to literally remove yourself from the situation and, you know, go for a walk. And mm -hmm. the thing is, it's easy for me to say that now when I think back on when I was a single mom, mm -hmm. there, there wasn't a, you know, I didn't have a husband to be like, honey, I need a break. I'm going yeah. out. But even then, you know, if you have to stick your kid in front of screen, even if you're totally against screen time, screw that. Like that needs to all all that needs to go out the window. Oh yeah. You to prioritize your sanity. Uh huh. And then also a constant, constant reminder that it is a phase. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I remember my first one just having so many issues. He didn't talk for a while. Like he didn't even speak until he was three, and it was so mm -hmm. frustrating because he couldn't communicate with us. And we're going to doctor's appointments yeah. and trying out if something's wrong and then he wouldn't stop wetting the bed and you know all this stuff mm -hmm. 17 now mm -hmm. he doesn't have any you know that's it's not an issue it was a phase we survived it you know and then we went through other phases and so just that constant reminder of this is not the rest of my life yes my phase. and take it one day at a time i think sometimes it's just so overwhelming to think like i can't i can't do this another week i can't do this another month um just take it one day at a time yeah that's excellent and also your kid it's like back to what we were saying before your yeah. kids don't need you to be perfect. Yep. So you're going to screw up. If you don't screw up, you, you're not even human. Like you're yeah. going to screw up. You're going to make mistakes. Yep. Don't beat yourself up for being human. Mm -hmm. And give yourself the break you need. I, I One thing I hear all the time from my followers is I feel so guilty taking time out for myself. I feel so guilty. I'd love to go on that girls weekend, but I just feel so mm -hmm. guilty. I feel so guilty. I feel so guilty taking a bath instead of playing another game with my kids. Yeah. Don't ever feel guilty for taking care of the most important person in your child's life. Mm -hmm. and you are not taking away from your kids with self-care. You are actually giving to them. Mm -hmm. You are giving them a healthier, happier mom. Yes. And that's what kids want. That's what they want. They want a healthier, happier mom. Yep. You are actually doing them a favor by taking care of yourself. There's nothing to feel guilty about. Yeah, it's like that cliche, I hate to say it, but it's so true, you know, you cannot pour from an empty cup. And I love that you said, you know, self-care is not selfish. It's really making you a better mother. And it's so imperative. Um, you know, we're giving, giving, giving all the time, and yet we forget to give back to ourselves. And that's really kind of yeah. should be the most important, or at least on the same level as yeah, ever. When I, when I first started sort of doing that, where I was like, I need to start taking care of myself. And I was, I was a young mom and I was still feeling guilty. And I literally, I remember because I couldn't afford anything. So I would just get in a bathtub and I would sit there and I would just repeat to myself, I'm doing my kids a favor right now. Yes. I'm doing my kids a favor right now. Yeah. Because right yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was. I was. Fantastic. Oh. So one of my final questions for you, you've been very open about, about your struggles as a single mother, divorce, um, and finally coming to the point where you realize like, okay, I deserve the love that you have now. Um, what would be advice that you have for someone that feels stuck in a situation, whether it's a bad marriage, um, their level of education, or just not happy with the people that surround them? Um, what motivation could you give to someone to realize like you're not really stuck, you can make changes and, and get out of this? I think one of the things we have to be really honest about ourselves is the things you believe about yourself and the things that are keeping you stuck, is it is it really genuinely who you authentically are or are you allowing your insecurities to call the shots? Mm -hmm. Because our insecurities are constantly lying to us. Yep. They're constantly lying. They are telling us that we don't deserve a better relationship. Mm -hmm. They are telling us we don't deserve a better job. They are telling us we're too old for this or we're too, you know, we don't look good enough for this. So we don't just, I mean, literally, the way I start thinking of it is, you know how if, most people, not everybody, has that one relative that you really don't want to see at Thanksgiving, but you know they're going to be there. Yeah. And you don't want to hang out with them. Uh -huh. 
So I think of insecurities as that relative. Mm -hmm. And what I used to do is when the relative would come, I'd be like, oh, I don't like them. They're this and this and that. Mm -hmm. I'd end up sitting next to them at dinner. we talk politics. Don't yeah. do that. We would get into personal discussions, you know, and then I would just leave and, and feel frustrated and I can't stand this and it would ruin my whole mm -hmm. uh, day. Yeah. Instead of going, okay, they're going to show up. We're, I have never met a person who's not insecure. I don't, I don't believe yeah. that's possible. Okay. But, can you tell that insecurity when they show up to dinner, meaning show up every day in your life? I'm not sitting next to you. You're going to sit on the other side of the table. You don't get to call the shots. Yeah. I'm not going to get into, you know, personal conversation with you. I acknowledge that you're there, but I'm not going to allow you to rule me, lead me, tell me how to live my life. Mm -hmm. And I think it starts with just that simply asking yourself every day, is this my insecurities calling the shots because they're not qualified for that job? Mm -hmm. Or is this really genuinely what, you know, what's, what I'm capable of. Right. And that's going to take a while because at first you're not going to know the difference. It's all going to feel like, you know, one big mess. Yeah. I think it just takes a lot of, you know, I, when I was going on my book tour, we handed out these cards that said, here's a lie that I believed about myself. And they had to write down a lie uh -huh. and choosing to replace it with this truth. Mm -hmm. That's a simple exercise, but you know, I used to believe that I wasn't capable of long list of things. Mm -hmm. Now I realize I am capable. I was yeah. listening to my insecurities. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Such good. And I love that you, it's so obvious that you put in the work on yourself and that's how you're able to just speak truth now and radiate just acceptance of yourself and others. And it's, it's so refreshing to hear someone talk like this and, and be so positive about the capacity for others to change and to better themselves. So I just love, I love hearing from you. Um, well, just to be clear, I am still working on of my course. Yep. We are all work in progress mm -hmm. and I still have bad days and I still, you know, I, invite insecurity to get real cozy with me and I, and I gotta dump it again so yeah I think, you know sometimes we feel like we just want to reach that level of oh yes. <laughs> i don't think that's what life is about like, yeah it's you're never gonna fully fully reach it but that's okay just keep mm -hmm. keep moving forward keep moving yeah. forward, keep growing yeah and i think one day at a time too just get through the 24 hours ahead of you and then we'll we'll start again just make and it yeah, and during a pandemic, one hour at a time. Sometimes. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, a minute at a time. Yeah. Um, so what is on your agenda? What is next for you in the remainder of 2020? What have you got going on? I have no idea. Uh -huh. I, mean, <laughs> I was supposed to be on tour still, yeah. on a national tour, and obviously that got uh, postponed. Mm -hmm. So I'm just continuing to create videos and mm -hmm. try to encourage people and, you know, I, my children are always my priority. So trying to just keep everybody moving forward and realize that just like everything in parenting, this too is a phase and we will get through it. Yes. I, I do think uh, one thing I compared this pandemic and parenting in general to mm -hmm. is if you've ever seen the Food Network show Chopped. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So this is how I think of whether it's parenting or what we're going through right now. It's like somebody handed us a bunch of ingredients we weren't expecting. Mm -hmm. and some of them we don't even like, and we don't feel like any of these fit. Some of them we might be allergic to, we don't, we've never dealt with. And we have a choice whether we're going to just go, I, I don't, I'm not going to do anything with this tray and we can quit. Or we can go, is there something good I can still create out of this? Mm -hmm. and so on my tough days now where I'm like, wait, what? This kid is now struggling with this and this kid just did. And, and now we're in quarantine again. And, what, and this, and now there's no school. And you know, like all these things. Yeah. I literally picture a tray of ingredients and I'm like, I'm going to win this game. Yes. Figure yes. Out how to put all this together and I'm going to win. Yes. And I love that. And it's kind of, you know, it, it, stuff gets thrown at you that you don't expect. And that's why I say control what you can control and focus on that. And, you know, I love the, the chopped analogy too. Um, so Christina, thank you so much for, for chatting with me. I felt like this was just such an uplifting half hour. I would love to talk to you for five more hours, but you know, uh, I'm sure my kids are probably screaming downstairs for me. Um, if you oh, yes. I'm impressed no one showed up naked. And yes, I know. Like, you know, I heard the dog barking in the background, which is definitely on brand for me. But um, there's no knocking. Sometimes when I do sessions, um, I'll have like my son pounding on the door and I'm like, ah, you know, uh, one of the but it's like real life. You know, it's you, you, you pivot. I have yeah. to do sessions from home now. And it's like, OK, you know, maybe my dog will bark. Maybe my five year old will bust in. Yeah go with it so you know exactly. um, 
And if people want to hear more about you, your website, your book, where can they find you on uh, social media? So on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, everything is at Christina with a K, last name K-U-Z-M-I-C. And then my book, Hold On But Don't Hold Still, is available. It's actually on sale right now on Amazon and Target for like 15 bucks, but it's pretty much available at any bookstore. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for your time. And I'm so excited to follow your career and, and get that book and keep getting your truth, truth bombs from you. Thank you.